thanks uh, to everyone for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Boss Kristen Carr. I'm the editor and publisher of Jacobin. And I will introduce our uh, panelists uh, shortly. Um, but first, I wanted to, uh, before diving into the really important issues we're going to have today, um, you know, the point of this panel is obviously to inform the theory and practice of the left the best we, we, we can and participate in that, in that important discussion. But the other point of the panel is to honor the life and legacy of Michael Brooks. And I'm, I'm sitting here in a room where I spent quite a bit of time with Michael talking about life, but also talking about the projects that we had planned for the future, thinking about the future. And obviously now um, it's been several months, but I'm still reconciling myself to reality that Michael uh, won't be with us for that future. Um, and that's a tragic loss, not only politically and intellectually for the left, but also uh, personally. But obviously the struggle that he devoted so much of his life to uh, is continuing. And uh, I'm very happy to be here with panelists that Michael really respected, talking about an issue that he cared deeply about, which was pushing back against some of the drift of the contemporary left towards identitarianism, towards particularism, but doing so in a way that wasn't a kind of post-left dismissal of um, the prospects that we had to, to build a class-oriented left. And it wasn't a dismissal of the struggle against oppression, but rather it was trying to figure out how can we actually win these things? How can we win more than symbolic representation for the most oppressed people? Uh, how do we win and, and cohere together majoritarian a coalition that could actually transform uh, the world. And I saw Michael's evolution on a lot of these issues and I saw him draw um, much closer to uh, thinkers like Adolf Reed in the last couple of years of his, his life. And he was someone who was always curious and always uh, looking to, to engage with, with new ideas. So I think, I imagine a good chunk of the audience will be with us on some of these issues, but I know some of you uh, might not. Um, but I'm very glad we have these panelists here. So hopefully keep an open mind and, and, uh, and engage with us as we, as we go forward. Um, so I guess with that, I'll introduce our, our panelists. And I'll start with Vivek Chibber, who teaches sociology at New York University. And he's also the editor of Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy. And the latest issue of Catalyst just went to press today and will be out soon. Uh, it's out four times a year. I really recommend you uh, checking it out. Um, it's, it's incredibly worthwhile. Vivek spends a lot of time making sure that not only the, the arguments are engaging, but that it's a easy journal to read. You know, easy to read, though sometimes hard to engage with the ideas, which is kind of what we, what we uh, want from our, our journals on the, on the left. Uh, he's also the author of Postcolonial Theory and the Specter of, of Capital, uh, he's the author of another book, Locked in Place, and he has a new book coming out from Harvard University Press. Uh, Vivek, remind me again of the title. It's Class Matrix. <laughs> yes, it's the Class Matrix. Yes, yeah. uh, the Class Matrix: Social Theory After the Cultural Turn. Uh, so I'm looking forward to to that. I'm sure we're going to have lots um, lots of discussions about that book in the fall. And we also have Cedric Johnson, who's a associate professor of African-American studies and political science at the University of Chicago, of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, he's the author of Revolutionaries to Race Leaders, Black Power in the Making of African-American Politics, which came out for University of Minnesota Press in 2007. And he's the editor of the neoliberal deluge, Hurricane Katrina, Late Capitalism, the Remaking of New Orleans, um, which came out in 2011. And I know he's working on uh, a couple other uh, titles right now, uh, but his writing has also appeared in, in Catalyst. Uh, he's actually a quite remarkable essay, which which is our only award-winning thing in the history of both Jacobin and, and Catalyst. It came out one of the early volumes of, of Catalyst, which you should check out. He writes a lot for for non-site, uh, for Jacobin, for new politics, for uh, historical materialism, uh, many, many venues on the left. Cedric is very generous with his time. You ask him to do something, and he will 
uh, uh, deliver your writing. And so I really recommend people check out uh, Catalyst and, and his work in, in Jacobin as well and, and keep an eye out for his, his books. Uh, Todd, this is the first time I'm meeting Todd. Uh, Todd McGowan, is that pronounced correctly? That's right. Yeah, okay. I see, I respect identity. Uh, <laughs> but, um, he teaches um, theory and film at the University of Vermont. And he's the author of Emancipation After Hegel, Only a Joke Can Save Us, Capitalism and Desire, uh, Universality and Identity Politics, and other books. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation. I thank you um, all for, for being here and for, again, continuing to um, honor uh, Michael Brooks's uh, legacy and, and his, his, his work. Um, so I want to just start with a few very broad overarching questions and then we can get into some more particular questions and, and I do encourage you all, to, whenever you want to jump in or engage with each other, please uh, do that. So um, Vivek, I, I think it'd be useful maybe for us to start with a broader historical um, point. Um, I was wondering whether you could situate how the left has historically related to questions of oppression and I asked that because often when you hear a lot of the left liberal discourse today about the questions of oppression, you would think that the left just woke up to this in like 1996. And, and then all of a sudden there's been this new wave of thinking on it, um, but, um, or, or even in 1960 with the, with the emergence of, of movements of the, of the new left and so on. But um, obviously there's been many generations of brown and black uh, Marxist since the time of the common turn. And, I, and I'm wondering whether you could just uh, reflect a bit on uh, the traditional Marxist understanding of, of um, oppression and, and how left movements have, have, have utilized uh, Marxism as, as a tool to combat oppression. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Bhaskar. And, you know, I have to say that it's bittersweet to be at this event, because on the one hand, um, it does remind one of Michael and his enormous contributions that were emerging and were going to, I think, um, uh, continue to develop over time. At the same time, it, it is also quite tragic that somebody at such a young age who had made such an impact uh, is no longer here. And especially somebody who at such a young age was coming to terms, I think, with the enormous um, contribution and also potential that socialist politics has for American uh, culture and American progress. So. You know, uh, it, it is uh, tragic. I, I didn't have much of a chance to meet Michael personally, but I, I was on the show twice and I was blown away by both his sensitivity, his openness and the, the sharpness of his mind. A genuinely curious person, which, you know, on the left is not easy to find these days. So, you know, that said, um, I, I hope we can do justice to uh, what he had to offer to all of us. The... Um, to address your question directly, Bhaskar, there has never been a time in the history of the left when it didn't center anti-oppression politics in its strategic orientation. It's not just that the left gave some lip service to addressing oppression or that it recognized the importance of oppression, but it's been at the very core of the working class movement and the left movement, North and South, right from the start. Now, it is absolutely true that the record is checkered and that the left was not, and by the left, I mean the socialist movement here. It is absolutely true that the left wasn't equally effective or equally devoted to every aspect of social oppression. And it had to learn from struggles of the oppressed as they were opening up and as they were developing, as has any other section of the progressive intelligentsia and progressive politics. But if you compared any moment as a snapshot, the record of the left, compared to every other political tendency in society, however um, sh uh, uh, short they might've been, however um, imperfect they might've been, they've always been ahead of every other alternative. And this is something that we understood as myself and others were growing up in a country like India, for example, but it's something that has very effectively been eliminated from the historical memory of the left by uh, the 68ers, what's called now the boomers and the people who came after them. So as now a younger layer of socialists emerges in the United States and elsewhere, one of the most important tasks we have 
is to, on the one hand, give its due to the left for a quite extraordinary record of fighting against other forms of oppression than just class, but at the same time, not be defensive about it, recognize what the limitations were and recognize where we need to go ahead of that. Now, that said, what was the traditional socialist understanding? It was an understanding that realized that you cannot dissolve social oppressions into class, but that the inequalities that emanate from class are the foundation and the necessary condition on which other social oppressions emerge. That is to say, social oppressions rest on inequality. Eliminating inequality, therefore, is the essential precondition to addressing social oppression. That elimination of the inequality will not itself overnight eradicate social oppression. But any attempt to deal with the issue while hiving off the economic issue is bound to fail in the following way. It will leave untouched the situation of the vast majority of what we call oppressed groups, whether they're racial minorities, ethnic minorities, women. It'll leave unaddressed the vast majority of those people's condition, but it can benefit this creamy layer on top in those communities, in those groups, who can do very well with weaker, less wide-ranging addresses to social oppression. And this is why the left always understood that when you look at race, when you look at ethnicity, when you look at gender, you can't look at them as homogenous blocks because there are going to be groups and classes within those communities, within those groups, who are going to have different interests from the interests of the vast majority and who will try to narrow the demands around gender, race, and ethnicity to suit their own narrow interests and their own narrow needs. And therefore, anti-oppression politics had to put at the front, at the forefront, the poor amongst those oppressed groups. And that will form then a basis of horizontal links between the working class movement as a whole and within the working class movement, racial minorities, ethnic minorities, women, et cetera. So the class question is never separated from the question of oppression, even while we realize that oppression cannot be dissolved into the class question. That's been the traditional left position. Where we are today is that it's been flipped. Anyone like myself or Cedric and Todd who tries to say that you have to go through class to get to the race question, to get to the gender question, it, there's the term now, it's called class reductionism. You're accused of being a reductionist, blah, blah. This is because this is also the period where for the first time in the history of the left, the left is largely unmoored, unconnected to the lives of working people. And in the layers where the left subsists today, which is the middle class, the professional class, amongst the women, amongst the blacks, amongst the Latinos, there simply is no interest in the fate of working class women, working class blacks and working class Latinos. So they use this as a weapon against the left. And until there are more black and brown socialists, you're not gonna find a way out of this. So Cedric, I, I guess to play devil's advocate, I think there's a common belief on a lot of the left that I guess what you would call black ethnic politics is um, maybe ineffective, but it is a positive residual element of the struggle of the 1960s. Um, uh, so, so in other words, um, you know, this existing uh, layer of racial affinity and symbolic politics, like it might be powerless because of context or circumstance, but it's broadly part of the struggle for equality. Um, I guess you could put it that way. But a lot of your work seems to say that, you know, this is, this kind of politics is not only a symptom, but kind of an, an outgrowth of, of uh, more than just a symptom of class uh, fragmentation, but it's actively preventing some sort of class reformation in the future and some sort of materialist um, class politics that could actually address issues of racial oppression. So first of all, I might be totally putting words into your mouth, so please uh, uh, correct me. Um, but um, does, is that broadly a good good summation of, of what you're uh, you're saying? And, and I guess could you could you elaborate on what the left should be thinking about actually existing, uh, let's say, black ethnic politics? Right, so I, I, that's definitely some of it, right? That's definitely a part of what I'm, I've been up to. Um, 
I also want to take a moment to pause as, as Vivek did and, and uh, you know, respect this moment, right? The fact that we're all gathered here to uh, honor the life of Michael Brooks. I want to thank Russell and Alicia for inviting me to be a part of this, this panel. Um, I also, like Vivek, had only began to, to get to know um, Michael. I never met him in person, but I was interviewed by him twice. And we were actually um, in conversations about doing this show again uh, the week before he passed. And so like everybody else, I was totally shaken by it. And, and it's really a sad and another you know, great loss in the midst of so much um, tragedy and, and uh, uncertainty over this past year. I want to um, pick up where Vivek left off and talk a little bit more about the 1960s and really that post-war period, because I think that's a pivotal moment. It's, the, it's the, the period where we see the making of Black ethnic politics as we know it, uh, which Pascal just mentioned. And it's also the moment um, where a lot of the troubles begin for the left in terms of how we think about class. There's a couple of core concepts I want to throw out. For me, they're relatively simple or simplistic in a way, but maybe for some of the audience, uh, a reminder might be helpful. Maybe talking about these concepts might be useful. Two things that I think identity politics um, does considerable damage to for us on, on the left. One is an understanding of constituency, right? And I want to talk a little bit about that, especially in regards to Black people and how we think about um, Black political life. Um, both from the 1960s onwards, but especially in this last year, right, given the second wave of Black Lives Matter. Uh, the other notion I want to bring up sort of related to that, because I think we have to spend some time trying to understand what constituencies are, right? Um, if constituencies are at a most basic level, a group of people with shared interests, we have to begin from the vantage point that they are not static, they're not unitary, they're constantly shifting, that it's quite possible for any one of us to be a member of multiple constituencies at the same time. That constituencies are also, um, they can be highly organized in the form of real lobby organizations or civil rights groups, but they can also be informal, right? In terms of what people want. And they can vary from um, trivial concerns, like I don't want uh, a liquor store built, maybe that's not trivial, but a liquor store built on the corner near my house or something very grand, like I don't think, you know, people should have handguns, right? So there are different kinds of things that we, we want as, as citizens and we align ourselves with other citizens in order to get those things. At the same time, what we've done uh, with the advent and the rise and really the dominance of identity politics on the left is we begin to use certain affinity groups as a shortcut way of thinking about constituency. And so the assumption underlying black ethnic politics um, is that most black people share the same uh, position in society relatively, um, that they're disadvantaged in some of the same ways and that ultimately black people want the same things. And any uh, serious consideration of black life, certainly by somebody who's lived in black communities and been a part of black organizations, that notion is untenable. But the power that it exerts in society is more about um, the ways in which it positions certain people to become spokespersons for Black people en masse. And that is a particular rhetorical maneuver which comes out of the Jim Crow period, right? A moment in which there's mass Black disenfranchisement, at least throughout the Deep South, but also in parts of the North and other states. And in that context, beginning in the aftermath of the Reconstruction era, um, various well-positioned Black individuals assert their interests, whatever those might be, uh, as those of Blacks writ large. Some of the most famous examples from the late 19th century, of course, Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee machine, right? His various minions who were, um, who supported his ideas about industrial education, who supported his ideas um, about not necessarily supporting, not just not supporting civil rights, but actually actively working against those in public who were trying to achieve full citizenship for, um, for Blacks throughout the country. So people like Washington existed in every town and in every part of this country, right? People who were well positioned and there's, there's some uh, legitimacy to it to the extent that they're the ones who have resources they have the ear of city hall or of uh, you know, wealthy benefactors. And so they do, they do uh, have some power 
within the context of Jim Crow segregation. But what they're also doing at that same, that same moment is they're not necessarily reflecting the broader politics, which as, you know, as Vivek alluded to, included uh, union politics, it included uh, socialists, it included all manner of, of um, radical politics, black nationalists and other tendencies, which didn't always square with those of this very small but well-positioned black political elite. What happens in um, the post-war years, I think there are a couple of things that we need to be mindful of and might be helpful for understanding both the advent of uh, identity politics within the new left and with a position that takes on, but also how um, black ethnic politics becomes fairly institutionalized. Um, before we even get to that period of the post-war years, there's the defeat of, uh, or the beginnings of the defeat of communist politics and, and radical left politics in the United States. And that certainly uh, gains momentum during the post-war years with McCarthyism um, and with the, the persecution of all manner of, of uh, radical trade unionists and other folks throughout the country. The same thing is true within black political life, right? And people like Preston Smith in his book on Chicago has written about this shift within black political life within this city from uh, a focus on social democracy, this idea that you know, people should have certain public goods regardless of their ability to pay for those towards this idea around uh, racial democracy or what we might call nowadays racial justice where I should just simply have the same opportunities that other whites have, that there shouldn't be any guarantee that housing, shelter, education, these other things are guaranteed to me regardless of my ability to pay. That becomes a dominant thread within post-World uh, War II political thinking among African-Americans, right? It's, it's ascendant. And I was reminding some students earlier today uh, in a conversation that many of the people who are pushing for the civil rights reforms are folks who are right, well positioned to take advantage of, of opportunities if they become available, right? They're college graduates, they're professionals, they're people who have some nominal ownership um, within local context in some segregated districts in different parts of the country. So they have a, a really clear interest to overturn Jim Crow because it is an impediment to their success. It's an impediment to their um, mobility. But with the advent of various um, you know, major civil rights reforms, it's not like the Jim Crow politics goes away, right? The politics that was articulated by a fairly small black professional and managerial uh, stratum, right? That politics remains. That style of politics, the sort of presenting or speaking the voice for um, the broader black population. And it remains even though um, during the ensuing years since the, the Voting Rights Act and major civil rights acts were passed, blacks have been integrated into all sorts of different parts of society. There, there's real power that's been achieved in, in some context, but, but ultimately, right, the interests of working class blacks is not always reflected in that, that, um, that politics on that top layer of, of black ethnic politics. And I think we're still there for the most part. The way, of, the way out of it for me, just to go back to my opening um, you know, notion, is to focus on constituency. If we're talking about black populations, let's not assume um, that people share the same interests. Let's not assume um, that all black people have the same views about police. I mean, again, any basic you know, uh, investigation shows you that many black people are very supportive of police. They wanna see the same levels of funding, if not more in some communities. They certainly don't agree with racist uh, policing. They don't want to see civilians killed by police, but the ideas are much more complex than some of the sloganeering that takes place uh, at the national level. But I, I really think we have to get back to serious consideration of, of, um, of constituency for a few reasons. I mean, for one, just as a matter of, of uh, historical interpretation, I mean, how do we achieve some you know, notion of historicity without thinking carefully about what people wanted um, when in any given moment, when in any given context, what they wanted and what they're trying to achieve. Uh, I'll just give you one quick example of how, how this goes awry. I was listening to a conversation with some colleagues uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks about the, uh, the, the January 6th Capitol siege. And what was amazing, the discussion was on whiteness and white supremacy. And 
you know, I don't have a problem with, with saying that there are white supremacists who are on the, the Capitol steps and who, who charged into the, the Senate chambers. But shouldn't we have a conversation about who these people are? We have the information, just like everybody else. They tweeted, they, they went on Instagram, they took pictures, they posted things on Facebook and told us exactly why they were there. Shouldn't we start from the view that there's different tendencies at work, right? In any historical moment, there's different tendencies at work. Shouldn't we try to gain a sense of the different uh, forces at play before reaching for some broad abstraction that doesn't necessarily capture the motivations of the people who were, were present, right? That's just not a helpful way for me in terms of interpretation. The other thing, if we think about the, the left more specifically, how do we build um, any sort of alliance is capable of achieving the things that people demanded in the streets last summer if we don't take an honest view of where people are in the society and what they want, um, as opposed to treating uh, either Blacks as all heroic and all you know, necessarily aligned for progressive politics and whites who we don't know and who typically are never in the room as always reactionary. Right? I think this is, a, this is a troublesome thing that happens on the left and I think it's summarized a lot in this whiteness discourse and other things that we engage in, but we, we can do better. But I think it, it's, it, it begins by us going back to questions of constituency, right? As a, as a real basic concept that might help us to slowly begin to steer the ship in a different direction. And, and this, this embracing of the concept of an of a organic unified black community and it being kind of uh, forbidden to um, attack the kind of um, integrity or united interests of this community. You know, it does have mirrors in how people used to talk about uh, national liberation struggles. Like, don't, uh, we're all united against our colonial oppressor and, and whatnot. So it's not necessarily unique in these discussions of oppression, but obviously now it's taken on such a such a big role. It's amplified in the in certain media narratives, um, you know, being pushed in certain history, being being. Can pushed I just say where? Can I just yeah. say one thing about this mm -hmm. though, Pascal? It's very short. Even when the left talked about national liberation struggles, they never ever abstracted away from class issues. So national mm -hmm. liberation struggles were always understood to be different from independence movements because mm -hmm. national liberation struggles connected independence with class transformation. And so it the the mistake of thinking that you essentially homogenous blocks trying to achieve independence was something nobody coming out of the interwar left tradition ever made. This is a, as Cedric is saying, it's a post 68 phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I guess so, um, I, I should get to Todd, but I guess, could you draw a parallel between certain types of like Garveyism and things like that and its conflicts with the left and things you're seeing now? Or, or was it that even Garveyism had more of a mass base and was actually more organically rooted in, in working class uh, Blacks? Cedric, you want to take this or? Well, I think, I mean, I think Garveyism suffered from some of the same problems, right? I mean, Judith Stein has written, I think one of the most important books uh, on Garvey, which lays out um, multiple contradictions as far as, as uh, him as a figure, but, but more, more generally, um, what his movement sought to achieve. Um, so I think, I mean, I think the parallels probably make more sense, you know, as, you, as you're saying, uh, with respect to Garveyism than they do with national liberation. Um, but, you know, Garvey, to be honest, engages in the same sort of politics that I just criticized, right? This idea of being um, literally the messiah of this broader black mass of people who are not able within that context to um, participate in American life in the most basic ways in terms of, of voting and, and other you know, basic civic participation. Um, and so their, their, their lives as citizens is curtailed. So the appeal to creating some sort of parallel nation state uh, formation appeals to people in that moment. Um, but ultimately, I think Garvey is guilty of the, the same politics that we would, we would criticize uh, Booker T. Washington for. And he was, he was a, a devotee of Booker T. Washington. So Todd, um, I guess I want to give you this opportunity to summarize some of the work, but maybe starting with um, maybe situating some of this transformation from uh, universalism to particularism that starts in the 1960s. And, and 
I guess it should be pretty straightforward, but maybe uh, defining what you mean about um, uh, the shift, universalism and particularism, because I imagine that even some um, people that we would we would think of their politics as particularistic uh, might not um, define themselves in, in such a way. They might not think of themselves like that. Right, right. I, I, I think from what, I just want to start too by saying I didn't know Michael, but I was, I only knew him as a fan. And so I was going to come on it someday. And I, I, I'm, it saddens me that this is how I come on, but I, I, I'm, I'm happy for the opportunity. It's great to talk with you, you all. And I, I, I guess for me that, and I think I, I see the same kind of thing that Cedric and Vivek think that see going on. And, and I think it's, it's, you can locate it either starting in the sixties or starting maybe after the war with critical theory, Adorno and Horkheimer, this, this idea that there's some danger associated with the universal and that we have to retreat into the particular to avoid making the mistake of Stalin or even making the mistake of, of, of Nazi Germany. Like that, 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 that kind of thing gets us, like Nazism gets associated with universality, Stalinism gets associated with universality. And so then it seems like an ethical move to retreat into particularist politics, I think. And I, so I, for me, that's the real, that's the, I guess the fall of the left is this fall from universalist struggle to retreating into a particular position. And I think it has a parallel with a movement from political struggle to moral questions. So a, a, a movement to someone like Emmanuel Levinas for, for whom the real, the, the real questions are ethical questions and not political questions. And so I, I think that those things are, are aligned together. And, I, and for me, the, this, this idea that, that the left can be particularist, I think that, that when, you, when the left abandons Universe, the idea of universal emancipation, I think it, should, it abandons being a left at all. And so I guess I, part of what I want to say is that the opposition between particularist identity politics and universality is really the opposition between right and left. Like that's the real, that's where like, so, so even if, even if a movement like I think there is a, a, a universalist dimension to a movement like Black Lives Matter, and and, and it doesn't. And but but I think it, it it comes through. It seems like it's particularist, but I think there is an underlying universalist movement because what it, I think what it, the movement is saying, and I, I what I what I take is really important about the movement is the is the are the slogans themselves like we are all George Floyd or I, I can't, I can't breathe these kind of things. Like it's, it's this identification with the figure of the person who doesn't belong, who's outside. And I, I guess for me, that's the, I, that's what universality is. It's this attention to this universal failure to belong. This is this, the way in which identity always fails, that that's where universality resides. So it's, so that's, how, I guess that's where I see the situation today. And that's where I, I, I guess I want to, part of what I'm trying to do is to call for a return to explicitly universalist politics to be, as, as that is the project of the left as I see it. So, so the core appeal is universalist in the sense that, that it's, uh, I think the, the, the way popularly people who are engaging in this movement understand it is we are marching for the same rights and dignity and respect as other people and we're in this broad multiracial movement uh, to do that. But I think that's also been tied into a trend in the media and in culture and elsewhere that is explicitly particularistic. So some of the rhetoric around racial disparities, um, for instance, it would seem to just like reify race instead of placing um, stats on, on, let's say, disparate um, you know, medical outcomes and whatnot in the context of, of class and neighborhoods and whatnot, it, it, it almost would seem, and, and obviously Adolf Reed and others have, have, have written on this, to, um, to um, reify the notion of biological race. And, and I think, so it's hard to separate the moment, in other words, yeah. um, I'm not quite articulating that. that no, well, I, 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 yeah. I see what you're saying. I think that's right. I think that's right. I think there's a way in which it gets interpreted back into particularism. And I also think any appeal, I, I find it odd that there can be any appeal to biological race after the genome project. I mean, let alone after the, after Nazism, but it's, you know, that the, the notion that race is biological, I think just has no, that has no place within any kind of leftist struggle as I see it. 
Well, I, I guess I'll turn to Vivek or Cedric or, or actually whoever, um, Todd, if you want to address this too, but yeah. I guess to play devil's advocate, um, there is a tendency within the left, let's say of the movement that emerged out of the 1980s that said, we are united in our particularisms in the sense that like, I am building a gay movement and this block of the gay movement is going to be connected with this block of the women's movement, which is going to be connected to this block of the anti-apartheid movement, this block of the, of, of, of all these kind of separate siloed movements, but they're not meant to, even though they all have their own separate kind of leaderships and committees and, and, and whatnot, they're meant to just be side by side in this kind of movement of movements on the left. So I would distinguish this from what happened previously, which is, you're embedding different struggles um, uh, against oppression within a working class movement because um, in that conception, there is a, a hierarchy that acknowledges the primacy of, of class and the primacy of certain working class organizations like trade unions and, and political parties uh, taking the lead. Whereas in this 1980s-ish um, uh, kind of post-New Left conception, it's these separate movements that are working together towards the end of a uh, towards the end of a more just um, uh, society and if that crude depiction is is right it would seem that in that case the particularism uh, might be um, narrow you could say but it's still pushing us in the direction of the direction we want to go even though the language and the form is different than our, our traditional conceptions on the left. Um, let, let me start off. I, I, I think we need to be clear about a couple. There's a lot of romanticization of what happens in the 80s and 90s. There, there was no movement of movements. There was no movement. 80s and 90s is when movements are dying. What there is, is there's a lot of workshops, seminars, conferences, uh, world social forums, which as a comrade in India called it, it was a trading fair for NGOs, essentially. Um, there's all these things going on. I would not dignify these with the term movements. Th this is the residue of when movements die. And essentially what's happening is this professional managerial class is taking hold of the rhetoric of the movements and is trying to carve out a niche for itself. Each niche is separately defined. So women's groups say women's struggles have to be autonomous because men can't be trusted, other, other groups can't be trusted. We're gonna do our own thing. You're welcome to ally with us. Blacks do the same thing. Uh, LGBTQ groups do the same thing. Um, the lie, the, the, the key to the fact that these were not movements is this. I, there's a subtle distinction between saying there is a movement of working people which is addressing different dimensions of their oppression, which includes gender oppression, includes race, includes sexuality. It's one movement addressing different dimensions of what they're facing versus saying these are all separate movements. Once you say they're separate movements, each movement is now obliged to render an argument as to how then as a separate feminist movement or a separate anti-racist movement, how are you gonna overturn gender oppression? How are you gonna overturn racial oppression? Tell me, can you do it without economic redistribution? Are you going to be able to affect the position of women without universal childcare, without universal health care? Are you gonna be able to overturn racial oppression without a jobs program, without single payer, all these sorts of things? If the answer is no, we're gonna need it, then you're obliged to say, how are you gonna do that politically against capital, which controls all these things, except through basing yourself on laboring women, laboring blacks, et cetera, et cetera. Once you pose that question, it's pretty clear these were not movements of movements. These were the death of movements in which the largesse that is now to come for the nonprofits, for the NGOs, for the university hiring, for the diversity programs, that largesse is going to be captured and taken over by the rising aspirant creamy layer in these groups. So to my mind, if there's an audit to be done of that era, it was, a, it was a failure. There's a rhetorical slight benefit in that they allowed these other oppressions to remain 
at the top of the left agenda and they still continue to, and that's a very good thing. But politically, they were, compl my view is, they're complete dead end. They had nothing to offer and they still don't. Well, I, I, I really like that, Vivek. And I think that, don't you think that it's, the, the point is that they, they, it, they're never they're never really as isolated as they thought they were, and I think that's what you're getting at, right? Like yeah, the, yeah. like like there's no way to address a certain kind of oppression in isolation because the oppression itself doesn't exist in isolation. Exactly. And I think like any 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 struggle that doesn't have, and, and you said this at the beginning, and I think it's just absolutely right. Any struggle that doesn't have equality at the height of it, at the heart at the heart of it then it's not really a, an emancipatory struggle at all, I would say. Yeah, equality understood a particular way, Todd. Not formally, all these movements for formal equality, as Bhaskar said, they want equal opportunity, or sorry, as Cedric said, equal opportunity. Right. But that is not a struggle for equality. There's also has to be equality of outcomes. Yeah, I agree and it's, totally. it's, it's not a left movement if it's not equality of outcomes. Yeah. So yes. and that means there's no equality without redistribution. And the key is, the left has always said, it's not just that you can't separate, because I don't want to slide into intersectionality here. It's not just that you can't separate. It's that there is a material basis for all these oppressions, a material basis, not ideological, not cultural, not attitudinal. And that material basis, if it is left intact, means, yeah, you will address gender and race, but as it affects the people on the top of these groups. And that's why it's so popular amongst university students and professors and you know, politicos and journalists, because yeah, every time the New York, you know, the, what is the New York Times view of racial oppression? Uh, the travails of black ballet dancers, the, the hard life of black epidemiologists. This, the, I mean, I actually have a catalog of articles they've written <laughs> since George Floyd, a movement that started off addressing police oppression and the situation of these poverty stricken communities ends up, once it's taken over by the PMC, being the travails of black wine test tasters. And this, this is identity politics. I actually don't know whether the last one was a joke or not. That's, that's I think- No, I'm, I'm dead serious. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. I'm, I'm, the, the, there's an article on the, 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 the travails of black sommeliers in the, in the New York Times. This was about three months after the riots. And this is, this is I, to me, it symbolized everything mm -hmm. about what happens when elites take over these these the race discourse? So let's let's think about or let's talk about how widespread this is. So obviously the media class has been dominated by these sort of race reductionist, if we want to use their own language against them, <laughs> uh, a kind of um, um, uh, rhetoric and stories. Within academia, in my mind, from my vantage point, it seems hegemonic. But then again, I spend a lot of my time in these kind of left liberal humanities oriented um, world like am I overstating things because I'm not as exposed to stem or or the harder parts of sociology or or, or history so I guess from each of your vantage points um, I guess I'm just trying to determine whether this is something that's a problem within the left that we're confronted with in the left or whether this is actually permeated um, how, how wide uh, this is permeated in, into broader uh, civil society, particularly academia. I mean, I guess I'll go first. Um, I think it has. And I mean, I think last summer gave it an important boost. Um, I want to I wanna say a little bit more about that in, in regards to the institutional basis for it. So building off of what um, Vivek mentioned about the, the, uh, the death of movements, right? So there's the migration of various new left political uh, tendencies into academia. That's one problem. Um, another one directly germane to this conversation about um, Black Lives Matter and how people think about policing stems from the, the fact that it was civil rights groups that were the first ones to launch really public and, and, and assertive criticisms of policing and the carceral expansion, right? And I think when you get those sorts of organizations being the first ones to, to make the, the case, they're gonna offer uh, an argument which is grounded in the world that they are a part of, which at that point in the 1980s and early 90s, when the first perceptible um, evidence of, of this new uh, carceral apparatus was, was taking place, they're gonna make the arguments that don't veer too far from the foundation world and from the corporate benefactors that they're leaning on in order to, to, uh, to survive. And so 
these civil rights organizations during the, the 80s and 90s, which are really in a moment of identity crisis themselves, right? They're trying to survive at, at a moment when so much of what they had fought for during the post-war years is being rolled back by uh, Republicans first and later by new Democrats. And so they're trying to figure out how are they going to remain relevant? And the questions of policing and mass incarceration become some of the first places where they're able to pitch a new tent. And I think the, what, the way that I approached that work is it was actually good work. It was important that they were the first ones to say something because nobody else was, was doing it, right? I mean, you certainly had uh, different cohorts of people who were against the death penalty who were organizing, but for some of these civil rights organizations, right, the NAACP, the Urban League and others, you know, they're grounded in communities. They have a real connection to other kinds of organizations and networks. And these concerns did emerge somewhat organically from what, what their members and people in these communities were facing. The problem though, and I think this gets back to some of the things we've been saying is that it starts out in this liberal plane, which never contests the capitalist order, which is responsible for this, this uh, burgeoning car carceral apparatus, right? And I think the same thing is true for Black Lives Matter, right? I mean, um, Black Lives Matter is, it doesn't really veer very far from the very same ground that those civil rights organizations uh, set up in the 1980s and 90s. And certainly we can find, and I always get in trouble if I don't acknowledge this, we can find some chapters, some individuals, some tendencies, some organizations that, look do, hard enough. that do offer uh, anti-capitalist you know, uh, criticism. But they're also within the ranks, those who are connected to the foundation world. And that's been from the very beginning, right? It's not a, it's not a coaptation process, right? It's not that right. they've been corralled by foundations and, and uh, corporate benefactors. Some of these organizations were created out of seed money from foundations. And so I think we have to be clear about that, right? That Black Lives Matter, it, it is dominant in a way because it, it works so well, it doesn't contest Liberal, liberal ideology, it just simply demands that liberalism, you know, have some meaning, right? That everyone um, be able to participate equally and that all citizens, you know, regardless of complexion or race or creed should be able to walk the streets without being worried about killing, killed by police. Now, there are some people who are more critical and who, who do call for, you know, abolition, defund and what have you. Um, but I think for the most part, like when you talk to students, when you get beyond the academy and talk to, to organizations, even people in, in unions that I've been involved with, um, they abide this, this Black Lives Matter uh, rhetoric. They abide the, the demand that those ranks swelled over the last summer, even though there's some evidence that people retreated from the, that support. Um, but I think we have to keep going back to the liberal ground that it's built on, right, that it's not you know, uh, it's not necessarily something that that is is more radical just because of the the intensity, the size of the demonstrations, and the the kind of fire that we might hear at the at the uh, at the podium. Yeah, so, I, so yeah, go ahead, Todd. Well, Bashkar, I was just going to say in response to your question, I I think what Cedric's point about liberalism, I think that's what the dominant position in academy is. So taking, and I think the way it manifests itself is that it we the starting point is always the isolated individual, right? And then how that, how that individual has to exist, then that becomes the question. But it never, the idea that the collective could be the starting point, that never, I don't think that ever gets into the way of thinking, at least in the, in the dominant academic discourses today. So I think that, I guess to me, that's the real, that's the real, like where the rubber hits the road, this idea of like the isolated individual as the starting point for reflection rather than the structural or collective situation. Uh, Vivek, you can you can you speak about the trends generally in the non and, and broadly, let's say the more quantitative side of sociology or in other disciplines that you're you're exposed to, just um, to speak it's, to the, the scope? It, it's uniform. Uh, the, across the in the 18th century it was called the moral sciences. Across the humanities and social sciences, it's pretty much a wipeout. There is a tremendous anxiety amongst academia, amongst academics across the disciplines when you bring up, they're, 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 they don't mind talking about inequality. They're happy with mm -hmm. it. But when you bring up inter, intra-group 
inequality. There's a lot of anxiety. When you start bringing up class differentiation amongst blacks, amongst Latinos, they, they do not wanna go there, quantitative or non-quantitative. When you bring up class differentiation amongst women, it's, it's anxious. And the, the, the question which I wrestled with for a long time in grad school, when I first encountered this amongst people who call themselves leftists, it, it blew me away that they thought class was a Western or a white concept and it didn't apply to people who didn't fit that mold. I wrestled for a long time with the question, is this an analytical error? To which the answer had to be, it can't be because these are awfully smart people, at least you know, as smart as they come. Uh, after a while, you realize this has to do with class anxiety. It, it's on the one hand, a, a very fine appreciation of the fact that if you start bringing up these issues, your career is gonna take a hit. There's no way around. And I can tell you lots of stories of people pulling other people aside and saying, hey, cool it with this class stuff. There's also this social factor. You know, nobody wants to be the, the weird commie in the room when they go to their wine spritzers and their Sunday brunches and things like that. You're the guy in the room that people point to and go, yeah, that's, 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 the, that's the Marxist. Why? You rely on these people for your career advancement. Academia runs on consensus, back scratching, everybody like it, getting by by getting along. You just don't want to be the one person in the room. And so that anxiety generates a desire to find an, a framework and a conceptual apparatus that occludes what to the rest of the world are blindingly obvious things. And that's the world that we're trapped in. One thing I've always noticed in my interactions with academia, at least up until a few years ago, no one wanted to be a socialist, but but lots of people wanted to be radicals. Like to be radical, everybody's a radical. Diffused, right? Yes. Uh, to, but but also <laughs> people do want to be weird. Like people want to be someone. Oh oh, I examine X common sense. No no, thing but that, that's through weird. the lens no, no. of Y completely fucking insane. People thing. want like, to be people quirky. Want to... <laughs> people want to be quirky. Mm -hmm. They do not want to be, however, what's the word? Uh, the estranged or alienated, right? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, yeah. They, don't, they, they don't want to pose a threat. Well, they don't want to be pinned down to, to a tradition, to a dead tradition, or to a certain... Uh, no, there's only like one tradition. No, right? uh -uh. There's only one tradition they don't want to be pinned down to. <laughs> the rest, they don't mind. Well, yeah, Marxism... I mean, I've looked, and, trust and me, maybe... I've done a th I'm, I'm in the middle of a 35-year ethnography of academia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I got a lot of notes. <laughs> I got a lot of observations. I'm pretty confident that's, about this. That's why I'm nice to you. I'm 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 aware that a memoir <laughs> is probably going to come in 15 well, years. So. Yeah, nobody wants um, to read that. <laughs> but um, so I I guess I guess that that settles it. Um, we're we're doomed, and this applies everywhere. Even the people doing math aren't aren't uh can't can't escape es escape this. Um, so. I guess that brings me to another another question, a bit of a devil's advocate question, but this one I'm more genuinely curious about, which is now, how much of this is the symptom, a symptom of working class defeat? Um, well, I guess we could agree that it is obviously a symptom of working class defeat that we're in this this environment, but is it a barrier to the reformation of class politics? And I guess this applies broadly. I sometimes look at this stuff and I'm of two minds because it drives me absolutely insane. But also it seems to me that a lot of this is so insular. It's so so just in the, the world of the professional classes and, and media and academia. And, and I, I wonder, well, will this just be sweeped away when there is a return to class politics or I wonder whether it's developing a life of its own and this certain type of very narrow identitarian politics and the media and cultural apparatuses around it, whether it's actually preventing a reconstitution of this politics to begin with. Because for instance, let's say if you do have working class people um, in a hypothetical scenario that are uh, turned off by the existing status quo of of politics and society and then the economy and don't feel represented. Um, if there's a left that's immediately uh, skeptical of working class people because they see them as hopelessly reactionary or imprisoned to white supremacy, it seems to me that might prevent the, the reformation of some sort of broad-based majoritarian class uh, politics. On the other hand, I see the people actually pushing this kind of narrow politics as being 
themselves not really capable of being a social actor or force in the way that I think of social and act, uh, actors and forces in, in a Marxist uh, perspective. So I, I, again, another vague, broad question, but I'll, I'll leave it to, to all of you to, to make sense of it. Well, I would just say that I do think that the theories that are current do have an effect, right? Like I think part of one of the things that I think we're seeing now is the way in which there's been a shift from seeing economics as the fundamental lever of oppression to thinking of oppression in terms of power. And I guess I read that as like the ascendancy of Michel Foucault. And, and you know, I think a lot of people have, I mean, a lot of people that are, that are, that, that succumb to that shift haven't read Foucault, they might not even have heard of him. But they're nonetheless, I think, in this wave, and because that's just in the air that people breathe. And so I think, I think there's a way in which certain paths get cut off because of a theoretical, you know, things that are going on theoretically, and so, and that's a problem. So I, I guess I, I'm a little less sanguine that there can be a popular movement that doesn't have a, a theoretical. They, I mean, I, 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 I do, I do take it. I, I'm materialist in the sense that I think movements can arise organically, but I do think there's certain ideas are in the air. And I think at the shift from thinking about oppression in terms of economics to thinking about it in terms of power, I think that, that that's become so ubiquitous that it's hard for me to, I think that has to be broken out of in order for then things to, to, to shake loose movement wise. I guess that's what I would say. Yeah, I mean, I, I would actually, um, I would agree with a lot of that. I think that Maybe this might be this might be too optimistic for this this panel, right? Um, I think a lot has changed. I mean, just over the last you know few decades. I'm not you know since that that era of um, the defeat of movements, you know that that uh, Vivek mentioned. Um, you know, we've seen waves of different kinds of of popular uh, struggles come and go, right? I mean, anti-globalization protests in the late 1990s. Uh, mobilizations against the war on terror, um, you know, uh, the, the uh, anti-eviction campaigns that came out of the subprime mortgage crisis, as well as uh, Occupy Wall Street and now Black Lives Matter. I, I don't think that we should look past those as, as holding some possibilities, right? That, that things have changed. We're able to use certain terms and talk about uh, capitalism in ways publicly that we could not, certainly not when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, right? I mean, if you wanted to write uh, a paper on Marxism, you know, forget it, right? That just wasn't a possibility within a, a you know, a ranked government and politics uh, program, right? People didn't want to discuss those things, but the terrain has shifted a little bit. I mean, I think that there's possibilities here in this moment. And I also think that we need to distinguish between how our colleagues you know, people who are professionally committed to a kind of identity politics, how they function, how they see the world, and, and all, actually how important what they're doing may be in the world versus how these things register with, with working class people and, and people in, in other um, popular uh, context. I think their, their understandings are much more contradictory, at least in my, you know, moments in activist groups, in uh, union circles, and certainly among students, I think it's many people embrace Black Lives Matter, but they're also concerned about um, evictions. Many people embrace, uh, you know, maybe they talked about uh, Kamala Harris and had her, you know, the, circulated the pictures of her wearing her Chuck Taylors, but they also were concerned about, um, you know, some sort of just distribution of vaccines and, and expansion of public health care. And so I think there's much more going on you know, and I also become distracted sometimes by my, my colleagues and by people, uh, you know, who in the world that we, we run in. But I, I'm, I think we should take at least some inspiration from different groups of the, of the working classes in this country who, again, have a much more contradictory uh, position on these questions of identity and who are not as committed, they're not as rigid, and they certainly don't have a professional uh, reason for being overly committed to identity politics. And so, I don't know what you all think about that, but that's just, I think maybe the more rosy view of things, at least from my vantage point. Vivek? Um, I, I would say, Bhaskar, both things are true. That is to say, it is an obstacle to a reconstitution of the left and 
when the left gets going, this stuff will become quite marginal quite fast. Now, so if it's, a, if it's an obstacle to the emergence of the left, how can the left then get going? It's that what we're seeing, the reason these things matter right now is that we are engaged in a battle of ideas for what you might call the cadre or the organizer base of the left. And the activist organizer cadre base of the left right now is as Todd is saying, it's immersed in this gobbledygook around Foucault and intersectionality and this, that, and the other, which makes them less effective, which makes them prone towards hiding themselves, remaining, the, remaining inside this bubble where people can understand what they're saying and are interested in what they're saying, and immediately alienates and turns off people who haven't been through the boot camp of cultural studies or sociology or something like that. So, and this differentiates our era from everything from 1900 to 1980, when people coming out of universities, people who were educated in radical politics, in, it sort of automatically gravitated towards Marxism, class politics, socialism. What's different about the, the intellectual left today is that it is deeply suspicious of those very traditions which the intellectual left, let's say SDS or the student left in the 60s, they just assumed, even the Panthers assumed that when you take up left questions, you do it through the language of Marxism and socialism. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that a left which is suspicious of this language and, and this framework cannot be an effective left. That's just because it's not connected to the lives and the experiences of working class people. So that's a barrier. And right now at this moment, when you have 100,000 people in the DSA, for the DSA to think it's a matter of debate, whether there is class differentiation within black population, it just means we are at an infantile stage of the left right now. These are the easy questions and the DSA wants to debate them. That's where we are. Now, if by some process, working class mobilization starts up, now, it's going to be an entirely different thing because that mobilization is gonna say, what the hell are you talking about? When people come in with this gobbledygook that they've learned from universities, these intellectuals are gonna to have to make themselves relevant. My worry is I would like to see a situation where the current left is already making itself relevant to working class people, black, brown, women, whatever. And it is not yet in a position to do that because it keeps getting in its own way. That's the problem. And that's why these debates matter for us right now. Yeah, I think one thing that's really promising, uh, to speak especially to, to Cedric's point, is that if you look at the concerns of working class people um, in this country, not just those that lean Democrats, but especially those that lean Democrats, working class voters care, their top priorities are health care, social security, the economy, jobs, and, and Medicare. Uh, so I guess entitlement programs. Can, can I just point out, Bhaskar, black work, every survey, survey done of the black working class and the black population generally, the top concerns end up being medical care, jobs, education, housing. Exactly. It's only the left that doesn't realize that. And, and it's the same priorities, the same priorities yeah. for white workers and Latino that, uh, that's workers. My point. The difference is the order is, 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 is jumbled a bit. My fear is that though the main, I, I think for example, within DSA, it's not people don't really debate that there's class differentiation. I think the real problem is if you were to do a poll of DSA or a poll of a professional class voters in the Democratic Party, you would see very different um, priorities. Um, you, you would see a huge gap between, let's say, crime, which I think was, was sixth among working class Democrats. I'm doing this off my top of my head. I don't have in front of me. And I think it was something like 17th for professional class uh, Democratic voters. And obviously, these priorities are so different. Your rhetoric, your emphasis, your organizing strategy is very different. So then it's a question of, of, of leadership. So I want a lot of professionals to be voting for the next, next social democratic leader in the United States, for the next Bernie Sanders. I just want them to be voting for a program that's built around the needs and priorities of, of working class um, um, people. Uh, I don't want to just, you know, completely abandon them. But what I fear is that even the figures I really like, and I'll use the example of Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, because I, I think in many ways she's such a uh, remarkable um, politician and figure. I'm afraid that she's going to be seen by the public as just being more radical and strident in her pursuit of 
professional class influence priorities of, of the mainstream Democratic Party rather than something different or distinct. And, and I, I think that was one of the, the great things about the Sanders campaign. It allowed us to stake out through using the vehicle of Democratic primaries, uh, stake out a, a different type of economic egalitarian um, politics. Um, but again, it does really give me hope that your average working class voter in the United States cares about these bread and butter issues that we can deliver on more credibly than the populist right can. And also that in general, people are getting more progressive on issues of, of race and immigration and gender. Um, in fact, the, the image is sometimes conjured of this reactionary working class doesn't actually exist. You know, if you compare polling of the, the 90s, Americans today actually want to either maintain or even slightly increase the level of, of immigration. This was not the case in the, in the 90s. I just think it doesn't know? matter. Uh, so what if it was reactionary? What are you going to do? <laughs> like it or not, man, that's your constituency. Well, well go, you have to organize. Right? You, have to organize you have to organize regardless. But I guess yeah, the key thing is we don't, we don't need to change people's. Yeah, um, no, but, but, yeah, but we should be I, clear I on we, this. We should, yeah. Yeah. That, yes, it is an absolute truth. As you're saying, it is not a reactionary mass. But listen, it could be. And you'd better wake the fuck up. The, the left needs to wake up. The only people talking to the working class right now in this country is the far right. And it's, it's possible that they move to the right. And you better realize that's your constituency, as Cedric was mm -hmm. saying, that's your constituency. And if they move to the right, it's on you. It's not on them. It's on you. You better go in there and start working with them. Well, is it possible? I just wonder if you think it's possible for the professional managerial class and the working class to be united. Like, I almost think if the yeah. professional managerial class occupies this position on the left, doesn't that push the working class to the right? Well, I think I think it's absolutely possible in part because I think the professional manager class of the PMC, I think, is a good shorthand. But um, yeah, I don't think it's a really this is, a, this is another debate. I don't think it's necessarily a freestanding class. But if you if you adopt, let's say, a producerist rhetoric that says that we are a coalition that's defending the interests of those who work for a living versus those who who own wealth and those who own capital, it's a 99 percent versus the 1 percent. If you adopt that populist kind of producerist rhetoric, I think that could be uh, an important part of, of building a movement. The only thing is the actual substance of the movement can't be that wishy-washy uh, rhetoric. It actually has to be uh, built around working class organizing. But historically, um, parties of, of social democracy in Europe throughout history, they, they've always had to appeal beyond the existing working class. They've always had to build up coalitions and uh, white collar worker unions like the TCO and some of these unions in Sweden, they were the most radical um, unions, but they did so under LO dominance, under working class leadership and dominance. And I, I think that's what's missing here. The uh, PMC, if you want to use that language, they, they can't lead, but I, I do think we need their votes in any sort of electoral um, coalition and, and they, could, they could exist. And a lot of them I think would benefit uh, from um, a, some of our program, you know, a lot of them would benefit from not being tied to an employer-sponsored healthcare, and so Two on. Things. Yeah. What, one is historically, exactly what Bhaskar said. The answer to Todd's question is: We know it can happen because it's been done. Now, here I would make a distinction between the managerial component of the PMC and the professional component. Professionals, absolutely. Managers, it's going to be harder because they are managers of labor. So it's gonna be harder to, to have them as a stable member of a left-wing block. But professionals, yes. And finally, I'll say this, especially today, you can pose the question of different levels of abstraction. Abstractly speaking, managers have some um, convergence, or not managers, professionals have some convergence with a working class program, limited but real. But in today's capitalism, it's even deeper for two reasons, and then I'll shut up. One is demographically, younger members of the professional class don't have much of a future because of the slow growth of capitalism. Right now in this recession, they're doing well, but the long-term prospects are still very slow growth, which means they have an interest in both decommodified provision of services and also in massive public works programs, in a massive increase in universities and hospitals and things like that. Secondly, the younger ones are much worse off than the older ones. So if you have a Bernie Sanders-like program 
with big public spending, with infrastructure growing, with increased education, to a significant extent, you can bring professionals into a political movement hegemonized by labor. At some point, it's gonna become hard. I doubt that that'll be in our lifetimes. <laughs> I, I mean, I hope it does, but at some point they'll, they'll start to peel away. That's been our experience. But at this moment in this capitalism today, yes, as long as they're not the ones setting the agenda, which is what's happening right now. If it's- Yeah, but I mean, that agenda. was my point. That was my point was that the professionals are the ones setting the agenda. So, so then it seems hard to, to imagine the kind of the, the, the coming together, I think. Yeah. That it is. That's I, right. I think even on the manager side, it, it depends on how you define it. So I, I know how you define it because you're thinking in, in broader historical terms and, and as a Marxist, but I think a lot of people in the U.S. define managers as either foremen who in other countries would actually oh. be considered part of the working class movement yeah. or even low level supervisors and right. things like that, who, who, you know, often are, I think, could be could be wedded to um, some sort of left politics. But again, this is why we can't fall into electoralism even as we pursue electoral politics because yeah. a vote is a vote. Right. But if you are a socialist and you're building a working class politics, then all votes are not created equal. It would have been better, for example, if Jeremy Corbyn would have lost the election even more dramatically in December 2019, but he kept the labor heartlands and he lost some yeah. votes in London or in the south of, of England. And that's something that's common sense for us on this panel, but it's not common sense, I think, to a lot of young leftists who are just just coming to, um, to politics. Um, but uh, Cedric, I'll let you have the last word and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. Yeah, I wanted to evoke, uh, you know, another great person, in addition to Michael, uh, who we lost uh, in recent, you know, in recent times is uh, Karen Lewis, who I think provides us with maybe the kind of grounded model for how um, you can see a working class, um, you know, struggle un unfold that does engage professionals and maybe some managers, right? Because managers send their kids to schools as well, right? And so, in that, in those strikes that we had here in Chicago, um, you know, over the last decade, you saw not only um, the use of a collective bargaining process to improve the conditions for for teachers, but also to to build a, a different sense of what a school should be against the onslaught of neoliberalization, right? And I actually think that, um, you know, kind of saying one one last point about Black Lives Matter. I think a lot of what drives Black Lives Matter, especially among um, Black PMC types, it is anxiety about their position, right? They, they, they find within this, this context of police killings a powerful symbol for the kinds of insecurity that they might feel within their workplaces. And you know, it seems that they're being called back to um, this longer problem of the color line within, within the American uh, context. And so I think it's become a, a really big sim symbolic, uh, you know, um, uh, struggle for a lot of Black PMC types. It's a stand-in for neoliberalization without necessarily engaging in anti-capitalist politics that might get to the heart of some of the problems that we're facing. And again, you know, Karen Lewis, members of the CTU, over this last decade have given us this this uh, struggle within a local context that's that was promising and and touched off a number of similar strikes uh, in places you would have never has expected in other parts of, of, the, uh, of the country. So I think it is possible, um, but I, I just think we have to get away from, from uh, you know, to go back to the next point, we have to get away from the, the workshops and the seminars and the endless conferences where people dwell in a certain level of not very helpful abstraction to talk about what should be concrete uh, concerns that the vast majority of, of people face uh, within this particular form of, of capitalist order. Well, I, I want to thank our panelists. Um, everyone should check out their their work. Um, and just one more plug for the new issue of, of Catalyst, which I know Vivek has been working hard on, and, and Cedric has a great, great article, uh, very relevant to the conversation in issue one or two of, of Catalyst that, um, that I'll share the, the link to. And also just thank you to Russell and, and Alicia for, for inviting me to, uh, to moderate this conversation. Uh, we'll be doing a lot over the next um, years and the coming years, uh, both uh, through TMBS, obviously we'll continue their efforts, but also through Jackman to 
um, honor the uh, life and legacy of Michael Brooks. Um, and it does give me hope that there are people like Michael Brooks that came and gravitated towards democratic socialist politics in the United States. Uh, it's a sign that some of our most talented and, and, and bright young people and morally committed people are being attracted to this politics. So that's, that's a, a, a wonderful sign for the future. I'm very happy that there is now a growing milieu around TMBS, around Jacobin, around all these other venues on the left that, that is attracting uh, like-minded people who are committed to the actual hard work of politics. And it's not enough just to pat ourselves in the back and have a subculture, but we need to uh, keep growing and uh, this thing until it actually uh, has deep roots in the, the working class. So I know our, our three thinkers here are, are not like the usual left academics. <laughs> they, are, they are committed to this. So again, thanks to their time and thanks to everyone for, for watching. Thank you. Thank you.